This video will be focusing on explaining how to read a telephone schematic. This is a request that I had and for the most part these schematics are very simple and should be self-explanatory but I will show some of the components in real life and uh, how they relate to the schematic. This is a drawing for a Stromberg Carlson Model 500 which is a basic rotary dial desk telephone. This is the same components that would be found in an ITT, a Western Electric, a Northern Electric, and some imported telephones that were made into the 80s and early 90s. I'll demonstrate the components um, and then again show you what some of the components look like and how they relate onto the schematic. And then later on in the video I will show a couple of other schematics. These are very basic and should be self-explanatory other than a couple little details that um, variations between the different manufacturers of telephones. And one of the biggest variations is the Western Electric and AT&T telephones on the hook switch, which is the where you hang up. And I have a touchtone version of it here for demonstration. So this is the switch hook plunger arrangement. So off hook, the contacts, some of them are made and some of them are broke. On hook, of course, they're the opposite of that. The Bell system, Western Electric, in their later years, used solid color wires, uh, brown, green, red, black, and so forth. As where in Stromberg and ITT, they were all slate colored, better known as gray, with a red dash stripe or a brown dash stripe, a green dash stripe, yellow, and so forth. And <clears throat> like the touchstone pad here has an orange wire with a black stripe. So on the other manufacturers of hook switch, you'd have a solid gray wire with a colored uh, stripe on it. So when you're looking at the schematic and they're saying in some stuff that it's a red wire, it could be a solid red or a slate red, a solid black or a slate black. That's basically the big difference between most of the manufacturers and the generation of phone. I have a ITT ringer, the a C4 ringer, which is a two coil ringer. And we have two coils here. They have a black wire and a slate wire. So we have the black wire. And then we have a solid slate wire, which is better known as gray with some people. And then you have a slate red wire. And this is typically what you would have found on the hook switch. Uh, a solid gray with a red or a yellow stripe and so forth. And then you, of course, have the red wire. So this coil has, or this ringer has two windings, two coils on it. One of the coils is 1,000 ohms, and the other coil is 2,650. Added together makes that 3,650 ohms. You will find on the later generation C4 ringers, which is what this is, is a C4 ringer, that it will have a single winding and you will only have a red and a black. You will not have the slate wires. The schematics may or may not reflect the ringer in the phone. So if it is a four conductor ringer, then you will have a capacitor which is a dot four seven, slightly under a half a microfarad capacitor that is sitting between the coil. 
The capacitor's function is to block DC, direct current, from flowing. So with that capacitor there, it's effectively, from a DC point of view, is like these two leads are not connected to anything at all. But when the telephone is being rung by the central office, they're sending between 60 and 110 volts um, AC at 20 cycles. Uh, normally it's around 90 to 93 cycles, or, or volts, I'm sorry, uh, 20 hertz. This capacitor then becomes conductive and the current will, of course, go from the tip side of the line uh, to the ring. In reality, you'll have your ringing generator in the ring side of the line going through the coil, through the capacitor up here, and over to the tip side of the line. The polarity of the red and the black is irrelevant as well as the slate and the slate red. The capacitor is not polarity sensitive, so you could hook the slate to the A, the slate red to the K, work just fine. You could reverse the red and the black, work just fine. You could also, if you needed to, if you're using real telephone service, not uh, VoIP service, you could take and connect the black wire to an earth ground and the phone would ring if the polarity of the tip and the ring line was correct. Uh, normally, that's not done. It would have been done in the days on the four-party and two-party phone service. The telephone network, which is what's pictured here in the schematic, um, is that component. That is a, rotor, a touch tone network because it has a terminal uh, T and S on it, which your rotary phones don't have. This is a rotary network, which is minusing the T and the S. The T and the S are nothing but screw terminal points. They do not connect to anything inside of the network. So if you have a, a 425K, which is what this is, here, and it's out of a touchstone phone, or would typically be found in a touchstone phone, I should say, um, the two terminals, T and S, are just somewhere to tie wires to. I could hook this, put this network in a rotary dial phone and it would function perfectly uh, fine. And in certain later generations of Western Electric rotary phones, they had this network in there, but they didn't install the screws um, and the metal uh, piece in the network. Uh, and again, the only difference was the screw terminals. So typically in a Western Electric, ITT or Stromberg, very old phones, basically phones made prior to 75 roughly, you would find this type of a 425 network. Uh, they were all engineered uh, and designed and licensed by the Bell system. So Stromberg, ITT, Northern Electric, and others just simply manufactured them by the thousands. I will show you a modern, late uh, 70s, early 80s telephone network. I should have some of them here. Here is a Stromberg Carlson network, late generation. Here is a Japanese 425 network. <coughs> So the packages <clears throat> may have different appearances and component layout, but they are exactly the same as that network. Instead of being a block with goop inside of it and screw terminals, they just have spades. Um, <clears throat> the term, the, the stenciling on the networks will match up with this, with one exception is they, some of the networks had an E1 and E2 terminals on it, which was extra one, extra two. So you could install this in a Western phone, ITT, Stromberg, and so forth, and uh, 
back and forth. So the network that is shown on this page, because this is a Stromberg, it's 425E, which would have been the big block ones. Um, this was just the later generation of the 425. So it has spades on it. And the schematic will tell you the network type. Uh, I don't normally pay attention to that, but I've also worked on thousands of phones, so it's just one of those things I'm uh, subconsciously aware of. Anyway, they show on the schematic the transmitter. Now, <clears throat> some people were referred to it as the microphone. Uh, the telephone industry developed the transmitter prior to the microphone ever being invented. So, these are, of course, T1 units of the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and so forth. So we have a Western Electric T1. We have a Stromberg, uh, or I'm sorry, ITT T1. They look the same. And a Northern Electric, which is Bell Canada. Also, we have a late generation dynamic mic T1 that is identical to these. And it's got enough the electronic components so that this item can actually be installed in a telephone. They have different manufacturer um, types of those. Uh, not all of them will be a direct replacement, but a lot of them are. They got a receiver unit with a varistor across it, and I will show you an ITT an early Western Electric. Uh, this was manufactured here in 81. Actually, that's not true. It was refurbished. 62 is when it was made. And then here's a Western one that was made in 1980. This is a germanium varistor, and then these are the more modern ones. Again, this is a U1, and these are U3 uh, units. Uh, U1, U2, U3, and U4 are the different numbers. ITT did have a later generation uh, unit for hearing aid compatible. They would be a unit like that with a coil wire around it. And this was a 1982, I believe, and up. And then we have a Northern Electric. I'm sorry, that's a Stromberg uh, or off shore receiver element. They're all the same, they provide the same function, they work the same way, and they're compatible with one another. So when you have a telephone, a hardwired telephone receiver, you would have a cord. So this end here has got four wires in the clip. So these four wires would be what would connect here to the network. The other end of this, where you have the, um, I don't know what that's technically called, but you have your transmitter cup that, when it's all put together, sits in there, and then your transmitter sits on top of it. So this goes in the receiver, and you have a red and a black and two white wires. The polarity connected to the transmitter cup does not matter and the polarity to the receiver unit does not matter. There's just simply colored so you can identify which tune goes to one and which two goes to the other. If you reverse them and they were the same at both ends, it worked perfectly fine because it's just a piece of wire. So the schematic here shows white and white, red and black. Well, that's what this handset port has. If this was a telephone that was modular, and they show down here the modular end, you would have this inside of the telephone handset, which has a green, a white, a red, and a black. They changed, uh, I guess for simplicity, for uh, training purposes, some of them have white and a green. I've seen them with two whites, uh, white and a green. They're both common depending on the manufacturer and the age of the telephone. So in that case, they show down here it, but they still, the tra transmitter, which is red and black, still connect to the B and the R terminal, and the white and the green or two whites would connect to the R and the GN. 
inside of the telephone set itself, if you had a um, modular telephone, you would find one of two types of cord, uh, uh, six, uh, 16 jacks. So the ITT was pretty common to have two whites, a red and a black, which matches the old style handset cord. And most of the other manufacturers had the um, red, green, black, uh, and white. Again, it's as long as the green and the white is connected to the same terminals, the two whites, depending on the jacket, you work perfectly fine. A little confusing that they did that, but anyway, it is how it is. Then you have in here the rotary dial, which has a off normal make contact. So this is kind of like a light switch that you're turning on momentarily when you take the dial off normal. The dial pulse contact is like a light switch that you're turning off um, when you're dialing a digit. So you could replace this dial pulse with a simple light switch toggle and dial a phone call if you were fast enough because all you're doing is opening and closing the loop of the phone line. That was uh, what the phone freaks referred to as uh, switch hook dialing. So I have a Western Electric number no. 7 type dial. This schematic does not tell you what kind of a dial it is. So it could be a number 7 or it could be a number 9. Um, it's the same exact dial other than one is much older. The purpose that for me showing this is you have the dial pulse contact which is right here and in the normal uh, home state it's closed which is what that is showing then you have another set of contacts which is the off normal that is open so when you take the dial and you go off normal and I'm gonna dial a zero you'll see one set of contacts is closed the off normal contact is also closed when I release the dial, you will see this little cam thing uh, spinning around, opening and closing the phone line. And I hope this comes out good enough on the camera. I'll try to get it right there. So, you'll notice on the dial there's a blue and a green and two whites. Well, there's a white and a white, blue and a green. The later dials made by Western Electric or AT&T would have had two blue wires instead of a blue and a green. Again, the polarity does not matter at all. So that's one thing that the person can run into if you have multiple telephone sets. Then the hook switch, which I showed earlier and I'll show it again, is this right here. This is a standard configuration for single line telephones. Rotary dial, touch tone, wall phones, or desk phones. If you was to get in a six button or um, 2564, 2565 key set, you'll have the same hook switch, uh, but the leads would go to different places in there. So again, I'll just show you the switch hook, which is right here. There's normally a plastic cover that goes over that. So if you looked at it closely, and I don't think I'm going to be able to get good enough detail, you'll notice that some contacts open and some contacts close. Um, and you basically have a transfer contact, which is right here. And then you have a make and a break. So when the receiver is hung up on the telephone you're shorting out the receiver element with <clears throat> the red and the black wires so that's kind of like a light switch that you've turned the light switch on it's a permanent short when the receiver is hung up then we have the uh, line going to or from the telephone company the tip and the ring on a rotary dial telephone it does not matter which polarity the phone line is. Now, when I wire stuff, I always make sure it's the correct polarity. But if it's reversed, it'll work just fine. 
If this was a touch-tone telephone, a Model 2500, and instead of having a rotary dial, it had a touch-tone dial, the polarity of the tip and the ring can be uh, an issue with certain touch-tone pads made a certain date. Generally, the problem would be with Western Electric phones, not so much with the ITT and Stromberg, because they adapted the polarity guard, in, which was installed as part of the touch-tone dial very early on, as where Western Electric never had a polarity guard part of the dial. It had to be an external component wired into the telephone. When they went to the electronic touchstone pads, then the polarity guard was part of the touchstone pad. But that is stuff of basically the late 80s and on. And it would have been with the 72 series touchstone pads, not the 35. So I hope that this explanation has a little bit of value uh, to somebody. I was again requested to make this, so I thought I would. I will briefly show a schematic of a Western Electric telephone set. So this is out of the Bell System Practices, and this is what the network, how they represented it. It does the same exact thing as this 425, because this was built off of this design from the Bell system, because uh, AT&T Bell Labs licensed that speech network. The information I provided is only for the standard telephones of Western Electric, AT&T, ITT, Stromberg, Carlson, Northern Telecom, and Northern Electric. None of this information directly will pertain to anything automatic electric made. Yes, they have an equivalent network. They have a rotary dial, of course, that is the same function, but none of the colors, none of the terminals um, will even remotely close to match up. So you cannot take this drawing and work on an automatic electric phone. You need to have their specific drawing for that phone, for that day, for that moment, with that exact part number because they hardly made two of anything alike. So um, you would have to consult AE. And they do have drawings and they're fairly simple to read just like this. Um, I'm not going to show any because I'd have to dig them out and I don't have time for that. Anyway, I hope this information is helpful. If you have any comments, leave them below. Thank you. Here is a, another Stromberg schematic for a wall phone, a rotary dial wall phone called a 1654. This is a little bit larger print, so um, the only difference is the type of a ringer they used in the wall phones has five leads on it, or some of them have five leads, some have four, some have two. Um, in this case, they're showing the, the coil is all wound without a break between the slate and the slate red, and this was to deal with party line identif identification and so forth. Here it shows the 0.47 microfarad capacitor, um, or a note to it. Right over here is the capacitor. So depending on how it's wired, this capacitor will have to be in series, or if it's a frequency ringer, it's got a capacitor already here. So you would have to consult the ringer, the schematic for the ringer you had, because there was a lot of different variations. Generally, um, the red and the black, if it doesn't have a weight on it, um, then it would be a standard C4, or in this case, calling E-type ringer. Here is a schematic to a 10-button wall phone, I believe. Um, part of it has a terminal board, so it shows the dial, and this is a touch-tone dial um, in the phone, a push-button dial. So again, it shows the ringer, and this ringer's got five leads on it. And then the hook switch, again, is the same as the other hook switch, same mechanical type, 
transmitter receiver and then they have a terminal board um, which has got a lot of screws on it because they've got a lot of other things happening here uh, on this phone so I just showed that as a reference here's a quick view of my workbench all of the videos that I have created of telephones and how to are done on this workbench directly behind me and I will make a quick view of it the noise that you hear is the interrupter of my central office working here is the interrupter that's driving the slave relays that you hear in the background here are the slave relays that are being driven by the interrupter the function of this is to provide timing pulses to other equipment in the building and this runs 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Here are the can covers that cover the relays. If you're interested in knowing more about the relays, go to the Stroger step-by-step -step video that is also on my channel.